come out of her, my people. All truth is not kind here. There's a bitter truth as well as a sweet truth. Come out of her, my people. Okay, Father, we thank you for all things. Uh, we thank you for bringing us this far in, in life, and uh, we, we ask and humbly um, that we can hear your truth, your words, and that uh, we would all take heed to your word to be transformed and conformed to it. We give you the glory for all things, so speak to us your words of truth. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, Brother Rich said he had something he wanted to do a Bible study over. Which is fine. Um, I want everybody out there to know, we all online, right? All good. I want everybody out there to know <coughs> that I'm finished with John Reed. Um, so he's not my brother. Uh, and here at Straightway, we don't play that game that um, if, he's your, if he's not your brother, then he's my brother. He's not your sister. He's my su she's my sister and all that stuff. We either together or we're apart. And that's all there is to it. It's like in Israel. You're either in Israel or you're not in Israel. Um, but I'm amazed at this generation. And I'll say what Sister Carol say, um, that the same type of standard and requirements in holiness that we require others, it's a remarkable and amazing how hypocritical we are as a people. We're not even capable of producing that same standard within ourselves. But we got people out here who have... Uh, done sins and still continuing in sins and thinking that grace is going to abound. And of course the Bible says y'all forbid. And we got people out here practicing sin, living in sin, and, and think that they're going to continue to keep on um, in the kingdom or with us. And that's not going to happen. Um, I do believe in giving people a, a, a lot of chances. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of times I go above and beyond what the scripture says. The Bible says first and second admonition, reject. And, um, and I'm sure that y'all can tell the messages over the last few months that um, I've actually really been hunkering down stuff. And, and um, I've got a lot of people who, who, who want to come here for tabernacles, and I've already rejected 35 people. Say, no, you ain't coming here. You can tabernacle where you at, but you can't come here. Somewhere along that, that line. You know the reason why? Because you can play church out there, but you're not going to play church here. Um, well, people separated, and we mean business. We didn't get to where we are as a community uh, by tap dancing with the devil, playing with sin, walking in lies and falsehoods, and being hypocrites. Uh, we got to the place where we are today because of obeying the word, being sanctified by his word, being washed by his word, and living by his word. Um, and the same thing that you expect of us as a people, we expect it of you the more so. Um, but my saying is coming to pass that no good deed ever goes unpunished. And it seems like the more you good you do to people, the worse they get. And so don't be, hey, don't be surprised if you call up one day and I tell you you can't come here. Or if you're coming here one day, I'll walk up to you and say you can't come here no more either. Um, because time is getting short. Uh, the world is in an uproar, a chaotic condition. Um, Russia has just got finished uh, sending um, a whole fleet of attack helicopters over into that land of a mess uh, while we've moved some warships over there. And um, what we're staring at, we know that World War III is coming. We know it's coming. And this generation, because, and, and you know the word I use normally, normalcy bias. It ain't never happened to us, so therefore, um, you know, we, we have a certain mindset that we function after. If it's never happened to us, we, we don't understand what it means for war. Uh, we have no idea because we're not interested in it, because if it does not directly affect me right now, then it's not, my, it's not, in my, it's not any of my concern. And it is a concern to yours because ignorance always brings destruction. Uh, rejecting knowledge always brings destruction. Uh, always does. Um, 
And so it's been a purging out process. Everything that I've said as far as Passover, as well as trumpets, uh, that some of you ain't going to be here. And ain't going to, you don't understand what I mean. And that's just true. And I got another uh, uh, guy that's causing a lot of problems. I guess it's the devil season. But we're not like other assemblies. Uh, you call our name, we love calling your name. We like calling you out. We like letting the saints know who the devil is so, and who the devil is using so that nobody is deceived. Because uh, the people out there may not know you're a devil. Out in Christian churches, what they do is they got a hush order and a gag order and say, well, we don't want gospel talking about it. We ain't going to gossip. We're just going to tell it like it is. So there's no room for misunderstanding. Um, but I got people that want to join themselves to them and stuff. And one of the main things is, is, is uh, it's amazing to me. And I want y'all to listen to me, Israel. You pay attention to people who do not ever receive any deliverance and those who have foul spirits and they're not getting the spirits out of them. You pay attention to that. Because every single year from feast to feast, we should be getting better and not worse. Are you following me? We should be getting better, not worse. Now, the difference between a tear and a weed is, is that they both grow up together. They both look just alike, and, and it's very hard to distinguish between the two. But today, it's not hard to distinguish between the righteous and unrighteous. The unrighteous just support themselves to their own destruction. They do it openly and don't mind um, expressing it to you. The righteous, they're righteous, and they support themselves openly, but they do it under the unction and power of the Holy Spirit. And I understand that we used to being in places and going places where people speak, speak to us smooth words with butter and honey dripping off their lips and stuff, and they're not serious uh, about the Most High. We have um, a, a power that dwells with us here, and it mainly comes through me. It comes through the ministry here, and I'm not about um, to let uh, devils come in and be friend and then think that they're going to destroy everything that the Most High Yah has built. You can forget that. Uh, there are plenty of people out there playing religion, playing church, playing with Yah, uh, but Pastor Dow is not going to do it. And that's just the way it is, and that's the true straight way. Um, but for everybody that gets it, everybody who understands it and, and who hates sin and iniquity, welcome. Welcome to the kingdom. Uh, you're not going to find any more faithful people or faithful brethren uh, than, than we are. If you do, let us know. Let us know. Um, we got a pastor up in... Um, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois, he um, went ahead and went through the painful change and um, lost everybody but six people in the congregation, all because he decided to keep the commandments. He changed uh, uh, their service times from Sunday to Sabbath. Isn't that something? And people blow up his phone asking them questions about the changes, and they just won't read their Bible. And I told him, be encouraged, pass it only a few. It's only going to be a remnant anyway. Just a remnant. That's all it is. It's just a remnant. It's only going to be a few saints, and that's it. Um, so I'm going to be going up there to see him. And uh, I told him, invite the district elder bishop and the bishop elder district and, and um, uh, the usher board, the deacon board, the ironing board, and every other board they got. I told them all get invited and come on down there so you can ask me all the questions you want so we can open up that Bible and see what the truth is so we can... Uh, uh, help him to discern even more so who's serious and who's not because this thing and time is running real short. Time has always been running short. We've always had people to warn us about how short time is, but now we're in it. We're physically, literally in it. We live in a country where you can't even protest your government for redress and grievance without the people who allegedly supposed to be your perfect servants who you pay their paycheck without beating the fire to you for exercising your First Amendment right. That's what you call freedom, liberty, and democracy. That's what they call that, all right? But if you don't have your eyes open up and you don't understand and see what's going on, you can't prepare yourself. You can't even make changes. You can't even begin to understand what you need to do next, if I'm, if I'm making any sense. So the truth has a characteristic about it. it. It has a nature about it. The one thing the truth always does is it always sets free. Now, we got the Day of Atonement coming up here, which here at Straightway, we wear all white. Uh, during the Day of Atonement. And uh, it's a sign of purity, sanctification, uh, as well as national repentance. And, of course, we're in the time of the year where the Most High is going to come and bring judgment. He's going to bring judgment upon the whole entire earth. Um, and judgment first starts with us, his people. Um, 
And so this is the time that we should have some reflection as uh, a nation of people uh, to make sure that we're continuing in his commandments. Uh, as we get closer to the time, the devil is going to vamp up and ramp up his game. Now, you can't physically see the devil, but you can, phys you can see the devil operating through the actions or inactions of others, the things that they do or don't do. Remember, evil communication always corrupts good manners. It always does. It, it, it just does. And that's why you need the word in you. You need the word in your heart, hidden deep down in your heart, um, so that you don't sin against him. Uh, there's only going to be a few. I know it's hard for us to grasp and believe. Uh, but I would say, just like when Abraham was petitioning Most High Yah, when he was only dealing with one city called Sodom and Gomorrah, he was petitioning them. He started off with the number 50. Something remarkable about that number 50, isn't it? He started off with 50 and still couldn't get 50 righteous in a whole entire city. So when I tell you that there's not 12,000 righteous in all of America, you can take that to the bank. Guarantee it. There's not 12,000 righteous out of America, so you don't have to worry about all this nation running to Yah because they're not going to do it. They're just are not going to do it. Uh, there's going to be a multitude, a number that people can't number that's going to be in the kingdom because there's a lot of people that's passed on since the inception of this thing, since man breathed his first breath here on this earth. But left alive when the Messiah comes, it's only going to be 12,000 sealed out of each tribe. And 12,000 are not going to be sealed out of Christians. They're not going to be sealed out of Islam. They're not going to be sealed out of Buddhism or Confucianism or Roman Catholicism. They're going to be sealed out of the tribe of Israel. So if you're hearing the message, especially coming from this Hebrew right here, and you can repent and be washed by the water of the word, turn from your wicked ways and walk in the newness of life, preadventure be the Father's will, you may, just may be able to have your name written down in the Lamb's book of life and become an Israelite as well. And that's just the way it is. We live in a country that's made salvation so easy that it's done damn more people through that easy salvation than it has saved people because the order of this book is, is that he came to save his people from their sins. And if you're continuing in sin, then you have never been saved. You're supposed to abhor sin. You're supposed to make a turn from sin. That's how we know that you're saved and we are saved and we are being saved is because we're continually to divest ourselves of everything that is contrary to the nature of the Most High Yah. So anybody who continues in sin and still claiming that they have salvation, they are a liar, and the truth is not even in them. Hallelujah. With all that said, all right, come on, Brother Rich. You know, uh, I, I used to do a lot of fishing. Uh, I used to do a lot of fishing, and uh, I've never been uh, what you would call a professional fisherman. Uh, not too. I would I wouldn't starve to death, but there might be times I'd go hungry. <laughs> I'll just, <laughs> I'll just uh, put it that way. So, but that's really what's happening. Is that uh, in the kingdom of heaven is is like likened to a net in Matthew 13, 47, uh, that was cast into the sea. Uh, the sea is this present world that we're living in, and it gathers of every kind of fish, which when it was full, they drew it to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels and the cast the bad away, the, the not good fish, the unclean. So it shall be at the end of the world, and as Pastor just so eloquently spoke, we are at the end of this world. And at the end of this world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Okay? And too often we read in there that, you know, some angel's going to come flying down out of heaven and he's going to just sever the wicked from among the just. Uh, but when I looked into that word in that passage, the word is uh, Greek 32. And it's angelos, meaning messenger. 
one who brings glad tidings to some, to others maybe not so glad. But by implication, it is speaking of a pastor, an angel, a messenger. And every pastor is given an, a message from the one who gives him the message. And that's the Most High. We can confirm this in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 16. It says, Behold, I'll send for many fishers, says the Master, and they shall fish them. And after, I will send for many hunters. And here you go, you're right here, Brother Elder Becker. And they shall hunt them from every mountain, from every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. Israel's iniquity, my iniquity, is not hid from the eyes of the Most High. You may put blinders on and refuse to look at yourself, but He sees all things. He does see through the dark cloud. He does regard with displeasure the breakers of His laws. So, at first I will re recompense their iniquity and their sin double because they have defiled my land. They have filled mine inheritance, Israel, with the carcasses of their detestable and, uh, and abominable things. Now the fishers are the pastors and the elders. They're the ones who have been sent forth. The priests and instructors in doctrine and discipline. They are sent to do this work of fishing. But what you have today, ironically, is that when the fish are caught, they'll begin to tell you what kind of fish they are, what vessel they should be placed in, how they want to be prepared, and what they're going to be served with. All of this going on while they're still flopping around in the bottom of the boat. And, and some have... You know, they're, they're, they're so excitable about their, and so passionate about their uh, being caught and how they want things to proceed, they'll end up flopping out of the boat and into another boat that's fishing nearby. And unfortunately, in the end, sometimes in fish with all that flopping around and so mutilated, they can't even be identified what species they are, let alone whether they're clean or unclean. Uh, so, there's not too many fishers that are sent out in this day. But many fish, I see gobbling up the smaller fish. I see that a lot. Um, and if this is not what we see happening today, then I've been wasting my time. And perhaps I should just pick up my net and go home. So, in the process of the restoration of all things, the fishers will catch a lot of fish. That's what they've been sent forth to do. And a lot of them are going to be unclean. And even the fish that are clean have been so environmentally contaminated by swimming in the same water with the unclean fish that they got the same attitudes and, uh, and the same... Uh, mannerisms as, as the unclean fish. So this is pointed at more the younger uh, people in the faith, uh, people who are just entering into the faith, into belief, into... Uh, but it does apply to all of us, young and old. Galatians 4.1 Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he, be, he is the master of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. And this is appointed of the father, not appointed of the tutor, not appointed of the governor. But the question I ask is, who is going to let you know when the time is appointed? It's going to be a tutor or a governor. It's not go you're not going to receive all this on your own. So, so it's not even 
uh, necessarily the men of Yah who decide when an inheritance or an honor is bestowed upon someone. I only know this because over the years I have seen it happen without discretion, jewels put into the snouts of swine, and uh, and the right hand of fellowship being given to people who, an oversight been given to people who uh, really cannot be entrusted because they're immature. So the works of the flesh are well known. These are adultery, whoring, uncleanness, indecency, hatred, quarrels, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and factions. This comes out of the scriptures, 2009. Envy, murders, drunkenness, wild parties, and the like, of which I forewarn you, even as I also said before, those who practice such as these shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim, or the reign of Elohim. 1 Timothy 3.1 Trustworthy is the word that if a man longs for the position of an overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer then should be blameless, the husband of one wife, sober, sensible, orderly, kind to strangers, apt to teach, and not given to wine, nor brawler, but gentle, not quarrelsome, nor lover of money. One who rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how shall he look after the assembly of Elohim? I mean, just the magnitude has just increased substantially. And this is the, the thing, and I liked in the Scriptures translation, 1 Timothy 3, 6. Because in the King James, it uses the word novice. Okay? Well, a lot of us might not think we're novices. We might not think we're, uh, you know, just uh, practicing at this point. Not a new convert is what that word means. Lest he become puffed up with pride and fall into the judgment of the devil. Mm. Because that the pride will always lead you to destruction. That same spirit deceived the halal, the devil. Who are we? But we're just men on this earth. And he should even have a good witness from those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Likewise, attendants are to be reverent and not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for filthy gain, holding to the secret of the belief with a clean conscience. Okay? If you want to cut your spiritual life short, ignorantly or otherwise, there is no faster way to do it than to attempt to move into a place where you do not belong at the time. A place not determined of by the Father. Now every high priest in Hebrews 5.1 it tells us that's taken from among men. He's taken from among men. That means he's been set apart. He's been set apart for a purpose. There'll be other things that he's going to be doing. He's going to be given a conveyance, a venue. He's going to be equipped. He's going to be given tools to work with that didn't necessarily reside with himself, but these are spiritual gifts that are bestowed upon him to fulfill Yahweh's purpose, not his own. For every man seeks their own. Mm -hmm. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained in things pertaining to God that he may be offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. 
See, the gifts that he's been given is what he is offering to the body collectively. That's, that's, he's, he's transferring those gifts to the people as the Most High sees fit, as the Most High uh, lights those candles within each and every one of your hearts. Those gifts are divided severally to you as He will, when He will, and how He will do it. So, who can have compassion on the ignorant? Well, only really a pastor, an elder, or a seasoned person can really have that kind of knowledge and discernment and compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for he himself is also compassed with infirmity and by reason hereof he ought as for the people so as for himself to offer for sins okay and no man takes this honor to himself but he that is called of uh, Yah as was Aaron okay so we need to be content with the lot that Yahweh has given you because the longest road to honor is disobedience to the word and the government Yah has established. One of the first things a child learns after he's born and he goes through the, the diaper changing ritual, the endless diaper changing ritual, is how to properly dress him or herself. Wherefore, you should gird up the loins of your mind, young ones, and be sober, old ones, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought up to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The mind is in the spirit realm is a breeding ground and a reproductive area. And not every spirit out there in the world is interested in holy living. Some are hawks and womanizers seeking to prey on your liberty and your newfound freedom. And they're seeking to prey on your chaste conversation so they can draw you away, rapture you, if you can want to use the term for what it really means, to every unclean thought and action. Can you think of anything more crazy than a one or two year old in charge of newborns? You know, we'll just leave the house and go shopping and we'll just leave the two year old in charge of the, of the newborn. He'll take care of them, you know. Well, basically, Daddy, Father God, Father Elohim has a shotgun and he doesn't take kindly to the spirits that are out there trying to uh, carry away and uh, take away his inheritance. He doesn't take too kindly to that. For though you have 10,000 instructors, 1 Corinthians 4.15 let me go back to 2 Corinthians 11. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you in the gospel. Do you realize and understand that those who have been given the oversight and government of the church are more responsible for you in, this, in a season than even you are? Do you understand the, the burden that that has been placed upon men. I don't see too many men running to that. Because I see a lot of folks that, because they're a new convert, and they're all excited about the preaching and the teaching and whatnot, they'll sit out there where I'm at. And if this hasn't happened to you, you haven't tried. You get a little gleam that tries to come into your eye and, and off you go you know so 
is it not obvious then that when you're surfing the sea of instruction and countless, nameless, faceless teachers is not the way to be great, uh, to grow and be rooted in sound doctrine. That is just too many voices, and frankly, none of our minds can handle such a raging competition for our attention. There are many, howbeit there are many different kinds of voices out there, none of them are without significance. They are all out there speaking to get your attention. Mm hmm. And we cannot have 25 and 30 and 40 incompatible philosophies dancing around in our head at the same time. You'd be better off believing the wrong thing until the truth comes along and you wake up. You really would. So, in other words, you should dance with the one who brought you. Simple. After all, you are not financially supporting everyone who hands you some information, are you? If you were doing that, then some of you would be penniless by now and more justified in the eyes of Yah than you are right now. No one in this ministry is trying to hold anyone back or down. This is not a chicken coop. All right? There's no pecking order here. And judging by some of the recent tragedies that we've seen befall people somebody some some people just like sitting on the on the uh, roost backwards and you know what happens when the one that above you decides to you know it's just not a <laughs> and it shows up it really does so uh, there's no big eyes and no little use here but there is order and there is anointing so much so that it was able to reach even unto you. This is nothing new. And having to address a million or so people on these things, Moshe had to have the very mind of the Most High. Okay? Moshe was his servant. And that has never changed. And it never will. So in Numbers 11.24, let's go there. And Moshe went out and spoke to the people the words of Yahweh. And he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people. You know, those were the ones that were by suggestion of uh, Ruel, Jethro, his father-in-law, that you appoint 70 men to take care of all this business so you can keep a little bit of your hair. So he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around in the tent. And in verse 25 it says, And Yahweh came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took of the Spirit that was upon him on Moses, and took of the Spirit that was upon Moses, and placed the same on the seventy elders. He did. And it, Now notice it was the Most High that did this. It was not Moses. Moses just longed for the ride. He's got an oar in his hand. He's paddling in his canoe just like everybody else. Okay, And it came to be that when the Spirit rested upon them, that they prophesied, but did not continue. However, two men had remained in the camp. The one name of one was Eldad, and the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed but did not go out to the tent, the door of the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. In other words, they, they didn't follow the other 68. They stayed back in the camp among the people, and, and they prophesied there. And a young man ran and informed Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. You know, it kind of reminds you in the, in the uh, Besorah where the disciples came to Jesus and said these men are out there preaching and casting out devils in your name shall we go tell them not to do it no more shall we forbid them and uh, Jesus said whoever's with me is not against me he that is not against me is with me so no leave them alone they're doing just fine and Yeshua 
the son of Nun, Moshe's assistant from his youth, answered and said, Moshe, my aunt, master, forbid them. Then Moshe said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Are you sure that when somebody says something that seems to be out of order, that they're actually speaking against or, or they're taking a place that might belong to uh, one of the elders or pastor? He said, are you jealous for my sake? Oh, that all the people of Yahweh were prophets. Wouldn't that make your job a lot easier, Pastor? <laughs> I think it would. I mean, and that Yahweh would put his spirit upon them. And Moshe returned to the camp, both he and the elders of Israel. And a wind went forth. Of course, you know, this was the whole ordeal where, you know, the people were wanting meat to eat. Okay? So, a wind went forth and brought quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on this side and about a day's journey on the other side all around the camp. That was a big camp. That was huge. It was probably like, you know, better part of Nashville or something, you know. And uh, about two cubits about the surface of the ground. Above the surface of the ground. Now, a cubit is like 18 inches. So we're talking dead quail, three foot deep, laying all around the camp. Man, now, all of us that like quail would have, you know. <laughs> but that, that wasn't a good omen, though, a good sign or whatever they might say. But anyway, the, it says... Um, so the people were up all that day and all that night and all the next day and gathered the quail. And uh, he who was least gathered ten omers, which is quite a significant amount because uh, uh, an omer could, a, a barley seed would plant a pretty good sized field. And they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. Now, the meat was still between their teeth before it was chewed, and the wrath of Yahweh burned against the people and smote the people with an exceedingly great plague. Okay? So, then he called the name of that place. Now, let me go back and tell you what the question was that prompted all of this signs and wonders and miracles and subsequent judgment and it says and it, and it says that they were they were hungry oh would we have died in Egypt and you brought us out here to kill us on our cattle with thirst and you know so the name of the place that place was called Kabrath Hatava which means the graves of lust because there they buried the people who had lusted. And how is it that with all of this prophesying going on, and all of this uh, spiritual flow and dynamic that's happening, that people are still dying? And it's just it isn't the will of Yah until we get it. And then look what they got. Do you see the importance of having the Holy Spirit? Do you see the importance of having an appreciably greater discernment of yourself and others than what we have right now? Even Joshua, the servant of Moses, missed it here. And we're not Joshua. So, lack of discernment for order was not yet complete. However, for the very next scene, or should I say obscene, the focus is not on the people only, but upon those who are leaders or otherwise viewed as pillars in the Israelite community. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Now, Miriam and Aharon spoke against Moshe because of the Cushite woman whom he had taken. For he had taken a Cushite woman. Doesn't tell you when he took the Cushite woman. 
We can speculate when that happened. If you will go and read supplementary sources, such as the book of Jasher, you'll find out that, at least according to those accounts, that that was Moses' first wife, whom he had married in Egypt, who was a prize for a treaty agreement between the Ethiopian king of Africa and the Egyptians when he was yet in Pharaoh's court course when he fled Egypt he didn't you know take his bug out bag or his wife with him according to the book of Jasher so uh, and he said has Yah spoken now now this is not the first time they had a problem or, uh, with with Moses' selection of wives now because Aaron was grieved when Moses brought Zephyrah back to Egypt with him as well he was grieved about it which shows me that there was already an established custom that the people uh, were to, especially the Levites, were looked upon as leaders and caretakers of the people of Israel even in those days, even though it had not yet been penned down by Moses, you know. So, uh, and, and he was grieved over her, and Moses sent her back to her father, Ruel, and later on it shows that she had come to the camp after they had gotten under Mount Sinai so uh, and, he, and, and, and they, they said has Yahweh spoken only through Moshe has he not also spoken through us now in the chapter before Yahweh speaking through everybody are they not? And, and people are still dying too so I guess not everybody was listening and taking heed so has he not also spoken through us? And Yahweh heard it. And the man Moshe was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly Yahweh said to Moshe and Aharon and Miriam, You three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three came out. And Yahweh came down in the column of cloud and stood in the door of the tent. Now, can you imagine his position being high and lofty on Mount Sinai? And he actually has to personally come down. This is not a feast day, folks. This is not uh, the Day of Atonement. This is just an arbitrary uh, uh, situation where uh, you've got people challenging the leadership and the order. Of things. So, and Yahweh came down in the column of the cloud and stood in the door of the tent and called Aharon and Miriam, and they both went forward. And he said, Hear now my words. If your prophet is of Yahweh, I make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is trustworthy in all my house. I speak with him mouth to mouth. And plainly, and not in riddles. Okay? Uh, and he sees the form of Yahweh. So why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Numbers 12, 9. And the displeasure of Yahweh burned against them, and he left. Now, that is probably one of the most merciful acts you will ever see in the Old Testament, as they say in the First Covenant or in the Torah, is the fact that Yahweh's anger burned and he left. Okay? Because if he's already kindled and in anger and he sticks around, that spirit then goes out, just the same spirit that got on all of those people he took off of Moses and placed upon the 70 uh, that began to prophesy all over the place, that same spirit, that same spirit will go out there and look for every imperfection, every sin, every transgression, every iniquity, until the whole camp would have been utterly consumed. In the scripture, in the book of Revelation, or in the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, that at the point in the not too distant future, that he will trample out the wine press in his wrath and fury. In other words, 
all bets are off and he's not leaving until this mission is accomplished. And that's going to be a dark day. And I don't think we really fully appreciate just how dark and dreary and fearful that day is going to be. Uh, the, the prophet Micah, he even said to do certain things so that you might be hid in that day from his wrath. Because it is literally going to make a clean, speedy riddance of all the transgressors in the land. So, the cloud turned away from above the tent, and look, Miriam was leprous, white as snow. And Aharon turned toward Miriam, and look, a leper. It's amazing. And, and I, <laughs> I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Please, <laughs> oh my master, please do not hold against us the sin in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Now they're entreating Moses. Aaron, he's got it straight now. He's, his, his, his bearings are back on track again. Please do not let her be as one dead when coming out of its mother's womb with our flesh half consumed. And Moshe cried out to Yahweh and said, Oh, El, please her, heal her, please. In Numbers 12, 14, And Yahweh said to Moshe, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and after that let her be readmitted. Now this plan that they had concocted in their mind was not thought out real well by Aaron or Miriam, obviously. And sisters, unfortunately, you often have to bear the brunt of not only your own mind, but the lack of discernment coming from those who should be withdrawing you from your purpose instead of acting the part that has befallen them as men. In other words, there's times that I just act like a stupid husband. And you know what? My wife has to pay the price for that sometimes. Never do we ask the question when we are in some doctrinal storm or being tempted by the accuser, why has not Yah given me the conveyance or venue to minister as he has to such and such a one? Well, I, I, I for one, am glad that uh, Yah has called Pastor Dow. I'm glad that he has equipped you. I'm glad that he has enabled you and put you in the ministry, his ministry. I'm glad for that. And I'm not, I know very well that though I'm crude in speech, I'm not crude in knowledge. Yet I am recognized that Yah weighs the spirits. And chooses whom he will, and that is pretty much the end of that. Pastor, Elder Shane, Elder Becker, and those whom they have laid the hands upon, or have spoken by word of confirmation. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that are going to be looking out after your souls at this time they are the ones who can be trusted they are the ones who have been given uh, by the most high uh, the conveyance to care for the people okay and there are at times there's points of doctrine and which do not agree pastor talked about that on youtube Okay? Uh, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Okay? They're being made agreed with one another through the Spirit of the Most High. Like Pastor said this morning, not everybody sees everything. Just because we're old, young, we don't all think the same way. We don't all, we haven't all been given uh, every, everything on the one plate that we're eating at right now. So, 
And we might be convicted about them. We may actually believe uh, that they are conflicting with the position of the leadership. Sometimes the leadership is wrong on certain point of doctrine. But do you really think that you're the one that's going to solve it? Really? Do you tarry and wait for a door to be opened by Elohim or you just try to kick it down yourself? Do you ever pray to Yahweh and voice your concerns and challenges in your mind on behalf of your leaders? Or do you just go like the old commercial back in the 70s and 80s, the Meow Mix commercial? Meow, 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 meow. Not too many people have the dedication, honor, or the audience with Elohim that Sister Bonnie has. Where the Most High actually answers her devoted concern for the poor, misinformed Pastor Dow. So why is Brother Rich talking about this now instead of Yom Kippur since we're coming up on it? Well, I have been talking about it the whole time. These are spiritual duties that we have. And those get excluded too often from the daily sacrifice and oblation. No improvement. Still stumbling in outward iniquities and sins and transgressions. And they must be addressed and atoned for on a collective basis on the solemn day of affliction. There's things that we don't consider in our daily life. Differences that we might have with opinions and stuff like that. These are the things that, that like Pastor Dow says so many times, they just fly under the radar, you know. And... Uh, those are the th that's what Yom Kippur is about. That's what the Day of Atonement is about. You, you go out and blow it openly. If you have the Holy Spirit, you got enough sense to go get that thing right, don't you? I... These are the sins and transgressions and iniquity that are so widespread in Israel that they have to be addressed collectively because they would otherwise be the nether millstone around our necks that would drag us down where we and, and, and you ain't coming back up from that if if you give place to that so uh, like I said before you dance dance with the one who brought you uh, the men of Yahweh are out there laboring in both word and doctrine for your edification your comfort and your profit okay uh, and they will, they will uh, do the right thing. And that's basically all I have to say tonight, Pastor. It's really basically all I have to say. Hallelujah. Well, bless you, saints. Thank you for your time. Hallelujah. All right. I want to read a portion of what he had quoted out of the scripture oh in 1 Corinthians 4 but I'm going to uh, read it from the Aramaic uh, and so you can um, see how it translates 1 Corinthians 4 15 starting there um, I'll start at the 14 verse it says I write these things are y'all listening I write these things not to shame you you hear what Paul is saying Look at this. But I instruct you as dear children. For though you have a Madrid of teachers in Mashiach, yet not many fathers. For in Yahshua Mashiach, I have begotten you by preaching. Y'all hear that? That's a whole lot better translation and understanding than the King James, isn't it? In other words, he's saying the way that you was able to come to this way is because you was begotten by somebody by preaching. You heard them preaching, and that's how you were begotten by Yahshua 
Mashiach or Hamashiach. Mashiach in Aramaic, uh, Hamashiach in the Hebrew, or the Messiah in modern Hebrew, or Christ in Greek Roman Christos, or Christian. All right, listen to this. I beg you, therefore, look at this. Y'all ready for this one? That you be like me. <laughs> Check that one out, huh? That you be like me. Everybody say, well, I ain't trying to create a bunch of little pests. No, because what's the pecking order? Who, who's, who's everybody trying to be like? Exactly. Hmm? But some of us don't see Christ. I don't see him. The only way I see him is through the word. Uh, hallelujah. We see him through example. Oh, yeah, we do. And he's telling you to be like, look at this. For this cause have I sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in Master Yahweh. Look at this. That he might bring you, that he might bring to your recollection my ways in Mashiach. Agreeable to what I teach in all the assemblies. You see what's going on here? Everything you just got finished talking about, preaching about. What, what happens is, is that the Most High has, in this dispensation of time, the Apostle Saul. And Saul is begotten these people through preaching because they heard and they were able to believe the gospel or believe the message by preaching. And that ended up drawing the people to him. Then his instructions from there was, I need for you to be just like me. All right? Then the problem we seem to be having, especially on that west coast out there, all right? For this cause I have sent to you Timothy, Frank. For this cause I have sent you Elder Pena. For this cause I have sent you Brother Roger, who is my beloved son and faithful and master Yahweh that he might bring to your recollection my ways in Mashiach or the Messiah agreeable to what I teach you in all the assemblies. In other words, men who know my ways, men who understand my heart, men who know the ways of the Messiah. And what do the men do? They go out and they kick against the order they set up, thinking that they're not kicking against him. Because somehow, some way, we've all become sovereign to ourselves. And we all think we have a, a, a door of interest, personally, that the Most High is just going to hear us, but he's going to destroy and throw away his order for you. I could understand if somebody would kick against my brother, Frank, if their character and nature and their lifestyle and standard of holiness and understanding and growth was greater than he is. So you see the reason why I don't tolerate insurrection? You know, if you're going to have a friend, you're going to have a brother, they first have to be what? Proven, don't they? Sure you do. Oil to ping you or... And see, we're not familiar with these ways because, number one, we won't read our Bible to study it to know how we ought to behave in the house of Yah, which is the church of the living Yah, which is the pillar and ground of truth. See, we have to be taught these ways because we didn't teach these ways in Christianity. We were not taught these ways in Christianity. We were taught um, um, blessings, 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 blessings. Be blessed, be blessed, be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. And every tongue that rises up against the judgment, thou shalt condemn. And we give you the next book coming out by T.D. Snakes, The Eight Steps to a Better You, and you'll find. That's the extent of what we call teaching. But as you can see, Paul labored dearly here with the Corinthian church to bring them online because there's an order. And you have to understand that as uh, people coming in, people, new people coming in, that the enemy is always going to have those who are vainly puffed up in the spirit of their minds to try to subvert your house and draw you away from the way things are and the way they should be. I can understand that if these people had a greater level of capacity of understanding uh, in the word that they had positioned themselves in the Most High Yah uh, so that they could teach 
But in order to teach, you first have to be taught. And you have to have a teachable spirit. Does that make sense? You wouldn't believe it. When I, when I went into the Army after about two, three months, I thought I should have been the Sergeant Major of the Army. Nineteen years old. Do y'all get me? It wasn't until I was 21 I figured out what a damn fool. And what kind of mindset was I operating after? No, it took me until, because I started growing. I said, you know what? I think I think I need to start thinking. Because if I keep going this way, it won't be too long. I end up like the wino drinking wild Irish rolls on the corner. You ain't never seen one of them? Every one of them are the greatest politician. They're the greatest philosopher. They are the greatest scholar that has ever walked the face of planet Earth. You ain't never met those street corner winos. They got the answers for everything. And thank y'all I had enough sense to step back and look at this retarded man saying, what is a spiritual, what is wrong with him? Thank you, Father. Thank you. Hmm. And some of us are 50, 60, 70 years old and still are functioning after that spirit. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of Yah. Well, let me finish this real quick. Y'all enjoying this? I've given a few ministers this book right here. It's a pretty good book. Now everybody out there, what, what, what are you reading from? What are you reading from? That's good, though. Not who you. All right, watch this now. Watch this. Um, now, some of you, look at this. Now, some of you are inflated as though I would not dare come to you. But I will come to you speedily if Master Yah will be willing, and I will know not the speech of them who exalt themselves, but their power. How many times you hear me over and over again talk about all these people who, you know, I, I, put, I usually say it like this. There's no shortage of preachers in America. But I'm tired of hearing words. I want to see power. Show me the power. I mean, I got sisters in this assembly that's got more power than all these preachers in America that I put up against any of these preachers in America. If you understand what I mean. And that is in no way diminishing a sister because she's a chosen vessel of Yah as well. She's just obeying the word. We got all these preachers and everybody got something to say but they're void of the power. This is a good translation, isn't it? Let me finish. Oh, good. We're five minutes out. Let me finish. I need to finish. Um, what do you want? Will I come to you with a rod or in love and a gentle spirit? That's what Paul asking. This is good. You ain't going to get this out of King James. No, you ain't going to get it. We can get this out of this because it's plain talk for our time. We can get it. But when you go back, you can see that's the same way that they were talking then. And he's, he, that's what he's flat out asking. You know, what, what in the world? <laughs> what do you want? You follow me? So he's dealing with some of the same things we're dealing with now. And, and no doubt, any time that you have the Most High calling his people together like he is, you're inevitably going to deal with these situations. I mean, for a little while, at straightway, we had a long period of peace. And we was happy. We had tulips in our head. We was running around smelling flowers. Coming to assembly thinking, Yahoo! No drama, no discord, just, just serenity. We almost thought we was one step from the rapture.
And then I heard in my spirit, the Most High says, now I want you to make yourself known. How many times have you heard me say that? And I started doing it. I, th I thought I was already known enough, but apparently not enough. And I was able to reach some of you by preaching. Now, whose doing is that? It's the Most High's doing. That's, it's his doing. We're all his vessels. But again, he does have order. Can you imagine Miriam? Hmm? Boy, can you imagine that? Now, the description was, don't let her be like one that's come from the womb. Half consuming dead. That's pretty bad. That's pretty ugly and nasty looking. That's the state that she was headed to as the most high. And as I thought about what Brother Rich said, he was hot, and, and he was he's right, dead on, spot on. The most high just don't come down that close to the earth and make that kind of appearance and then just go away without causing all kind of destruction. So he had to, you ever been angry and then hold, I mean, you're holding it. You ever done that? And you know the most high, when he get angry, things just change. Now, I'm not there. I don't question his judgment, but I can tell you one thing. The energy and the strength and the power had to be coming through Miriam. Because we don't get anything from old weak Aaron getting anything done to him. Now, even though he physically didn't get, have anything done to him, he was still affected because he loved his sister greatly. And it was only until after judgment that he could see what he was doing to Moses. And that's one thing about the scriptures that we have today. It's just like Job, three friends, was running him through the gauntlet. They thought after it was all said and done that they could just sashay on up in front of the presence of the Most High. The Most High said, no, you get out of my face. You go and you entreat Job. And if Job says that he's forgiven you, then I'll forgive you. If Job says if it's okay, then I will consider you. But today, we all prophets and preachers and pastors, and we can just sashay on up to the Most High like we want. No wonder you're still in your sin and blind. Because a person in sin is so blind they can't see. And you have to understand, I'm, I'm finished on this. The uniqueness of a reprobate mind. See, a reprobate mind, there's no convincing that it's wrong. A reprobate mind is a person that is right in their own eyes. As a matter of fact, a reprobate mind is a type of mindset that you can't do nothing about. Because look at this. You have personally been given over to it by the Most High Yah himself. And he is not trying to change your mind one bit. As a matter of fact, he is giving you over to your ways. And there's nobody on this earth that can convince you that you're wrong when you have a reprobate mind. You know why? Because nobody's going to fight against the Most High Yah. He's the one who's given over. And for this cause, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are un un uncomely, unseemly. That's why you can't convince a whoremonger, a, a person that's full of this spirit of homosexuality. They'll justify it to the end in days. They'll come up and make stories. Jonathan and David was homosexuals. And they'll go to church. And they'll shout and praise more than you. But yet they're giving over. A drunkard. An adulterer. A fornicator. A whoremonger. A liar, a murderer, a cheat, a steal. They'll continue on in this, never repent, because their mind has been given over to a reprobate mind. They have convinced even them own selves for so long that they're right that God says, have it your way. That's the type of mindset we try our best to keep people from getting to. Because 
we can't determine when it will happen, but we know it does happen. You ever seen people leave situations they never repent, never change, and no matter what, they still write in their own eyes? And no amount of any treating that you give whatsoever at all, they still can't hear, but they still go on in their way? Because we've lost the fear of y'all. See, the word is very serious, and, and everything we, I just got finished talking to you about is all in the renewed covenant. Every bit of it is. It's just that we don't read it that way. The book is for sanctification and for holiness because the Most High Yah is going to have a people before he comes. That's why he has us keeping his commandments and have the testimony of the Messiah. He's going to have a people. You can believe that. He is going to have a people. Sure, we look like the all scouring of the earth. Sure, we look like the rejects, and we are. Matter of fact, Paul even says it early in this, which this translation says it a whole lot better. It really, truly does. And um, we can expect that type of walk amongst these heathens that we find ourselves surrounded by. But know this. Know this. That during this time of the year, this fall feast, this is a pure reminder that all the nations of the earth is going to be our servants not only is the most high going to come and set things right and destroy a lot of people but the nations are going to be your slaves that's another thing you never hear talked about in the messianic movement because it was a religion created in the 60s it's brand new in its inception it has never been around and always been around but this book has always been around, and the pe his people has always been around. But that's another thing that they don't talk about is how that the nations are going to serve you. And we'll bring more of that out, too, because it is the truth. That's how the prophets speak. If you want to jump start on it, spend some time with the prophet Isaiah. He writes a lot of books, too. Hey, Isaiah got a big hand. Hallelujah. Y'all be encouraged? All y'all out there? Be encouraged, I'm finished with John Reed. Father, we thank you for these words of truth. We pray these sins sink deep down in the hearts of your people, called and chosen and elected of the Most High God by the blood of Yahshua HaMashiach. We give you the glory for all things. Amen. Y'all be encouraged, saints. King coming. Uh-oh, look at him looking.